Let's bring in now, live from Perth, where this speech has been underway. Uh, most of the Shadow Cabinet were there to hear their leader deliver it. Joel Fitzgibbon is the Shadow Agriculture and Resources Minister. Very good afternoon to you. Thanks for ducking out of, uh, of the speech to join us. Look, is this a different direction from Labor to the one we saw under Bill Shorten at the last two elections? Certainly, David. Anthony Albanese made a very, very good speech here in Perth today, home, of course, to a significant part of our resources and agriculture sectors, and therefore a great place to be to do it for, uh, for me and many of my colleagues. Look, Albo made something very, very clear today in this value statement. That is that his priority is jobs. And he talked about committing himself to both growing jobs, meaningful, skilled jobs, and investing in people to ensure that every Australian has an opportunity to secure meaningful work. He talked about the challenges and disruption happening in the global economy and how we need to look at them, sure, as a challenge, but to take opportunity uh, uh, from it. He talked about investing in people, of course, and very, very importantly, he said that we can build a modern and clean economy without forsaking blue-collar jobs in areas like mining and the manufacturing sector. That will be very, very good news to our working class base. Well, let me ask you about that because I must admit I haven't met a politician yet who hasn't wanted to create jobs and see jobs growth. How will Labor be able to deliver this clean energy future and all these jobs, including in the coal mining sector? Well, first of all, uh, it's not just about talking about jobs. Uh, it's about ensuring that we maximise jobs growth and we have the skilled workforce to fill those jobs. See, in many regions of Australia, David, people don't fully appreciate this. The, op the problem is that job not so much jobs aren't available. In areas like uh, meat manufacturing, for example, our abattoirs, the real challenge is getting the skilled people we need to fill those jobs. So he's laid, mm -hmm. laid out a roadmap uh, so how for do you do ensuring that, that government plays... And play, government plays a major role with all those various stakeholders he was talking about, business unions, etc., to ensure that people are getting the skills they need, but also we're matching the skills with the jobs which are available. Not just traditional jobs, but the emerging jobs in the economy of the 21st century. But you, you, you've, you've identified the problem there. Uh, you know, some, a lot of people don't want to work in an abattoir. I'm, I'm sure in your electorate that's the situation. So what, what will you do to solve that? Well, again, it's, it's, it's doing the work needed and getting the coordinated uh, effort required amongst all the stakeholders, right, right down to kindergarten, by the way. He didn't speak about that today, David. We've got to make sure that people have the best opportunity right from that, at that kindergarten level of schooling. But beyond that, of course, the best school education and being able to access the, the tertiary education they require to fulfil their own aspirations, whether that be in the TAFE sector. He put a lot of emphasis on traditional trades today, getting government more interested in ensuring that we have the people who want to be in a trade, have that opportunity and can fill those, those skill gaps in the economy. And, of course, opportunities for people in, uh, in the high-tech se sector. He talked about the creative arts sector. This is a broad-ranging view today, but the con construction he was talking about today that he's promised in government will ensure that we invest in our people, have the skills necessary, and people have the opportunity to be matched with those opportunities, whether they be in traditional industries or the new and emerging industries. OK, so we are... It's right to interpret this as flagging a lot more investment in skills training. Investment in skills training and people, but government playing a role in guiding the economy. Look, we, we're not the party of heavy government intervention. But we do believe there's a role for government in coordinating and giving guidance in education and training and, and matching those skill sets uh, to the opportunities are, that are out there in, in the economy. So this is a very th good thing to be doing. Uh, I'm delighted by it and I'm particularly delighted uh, by the talk of traditional skills, trades and, of course, that commitment to the resources sector, including the coal mining sector. Let me, let me ask you about the resources sector, because he's, he's spoken a fair bit about lithium in particular. Uh, you know, there's, I think, as he noted, seven uh, lithium mines in WA, uh, two processing facilities, a third being planned. So what would Labor do to really ramp that up? Well, he talked in particular about rare earths, and Australia is well endowed with these minerals products, uh, heavily uh, available in China. 
but also heavily available under our surface here in Australia. But not just digging them up, but ensuring that we add value to them here in Australia rather than export the rare earths, only to import them back into this country, whether it be as a How battery... How do you do that? What, 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 some form what would government some electric do to make that happen? Well, you need to provide the environment and to give business incentive to do these things onshore rather than go seeking lower cost jurisdictions overseas now. He didn't talk taxes. about how we he didn't talk about well obviously it's a value statement today. He didn't talk how talk about how Labor intends to do that. But it's important that we start talking about that now almost three years out from an election and that gives us a considerable period of time to consult with business, mm. talk to business about how they believe no, Labor could best achieve that uh, very, very good objective. Bottom line, you might have heard Angus Taylor make the point, uh, we need lower energy costs for any of this manufacturing or mining uh, to have a future in Australia. It, can Labor stick with the sort of emissions and carbon uh, reduction policy that it took to the election? Well, he's a bit sad and try-hard, Angus, uh, isn't he? I mean, we saw the big blow-up today between Matt Canavan and the Prime Minister about the coal generation industry. This is exactly the sort of dust-up you can expect, uh, David, when the government doesn't have an energy policy. We do believe, and Anthony Albanese... But with Albanese respect, Joel Fitzgibbon, today, you're, you can odds, build you're a odds with many of your economy. colleagues on this very issue too. No, I don't think that's true, uh, David. Me and all of my colleagues want the same thing. We want to build a modern and clean economy. But the point Alba was making today is that there is opportunity in that for us, for us. He made the point that it takes 200 tonnes of coking coal to build one turbine. Imagine providing that coal to a growing Asia. Well, as we all, all, already do. But those opportunities will grow. And that's just one example of how we can use our natural uh, resources, gas, uh, and it's linked to hydrogen, for example, to grow these new opportunities in this, the Asian century. Does thermal coal have a future, particularly in places like your backyard, the Hunter Valley? Well, thermal coal will continue to feed our coal-fired generations here in, generators here in Australia until those coal generators come to the end of their physical and economic lives. In some cases, like it? the general in the Hunter Valley, that's just in a few years, and then uh, many decades ahead for some of the, the newer generators. So. Coal will continue to play a role in electricity generation here in Australia for, for decades to come. Right. But internationally, David, where coal still, play, still accounts for 60% of electricity generation, we'll be exporting thermal coal for a long, long time. And remember, David, if, for example, you have 50% of your economy run on renewables, you have 50% still running on fossil fuels or some, some other form. If it's not nuclear, and it won't be, then obviously... Uh, that, that will be foss a, a, a fossil fuel source. Can I just play this? Kim Carr on radio today, one of your colleagues, uh, not, uh, well, uh, seemed a little nonplussed with what Anthony Albanese's uh, announced. Have a look. No, well, that, the policy hasn't changed. I haven't seen the... I've made similar comments around our, our policy on industry policy for some time about the importance of, of high-quality, high-skilled, high-wage blue-collar jobs and uh, have done so for some time. Is Kim Carr right or is he missing something here? Well, Kim Carr is right. He has been talking about these things for many years. He's been a strong advocate uh, on industry policy. He's been a strong advocate for manufacturing. He's been a strong advocate for, for blue-collar jobs. And what Anthony Albanese said today is, so am I. And I'm not just going to talk about it, I'm going to do something about it, not just in the next three years as we develop policy, but if he becomes uh, the Prime Minister of Australia. All right, well, uh, let, let's turn to the drought. You were there on Q&A last night with David Little, proud just to bring viewers up to speed. Here's what the drought minister said about the farm household allowance, which at the moment, to be clear, you get for four years, and then at the end of that, as recently announced, you get a six-month lump sum payment. But here's what the minister said last night. Prime Minister said that even farm household assistance, those that come off it after four years, they will continue to stay on, on, under the supplementary payments until this drought is over. It's not correct to say people are being kicked off the farm household allowance. No one will be. And even the Prime Minister's made that clear. They will still get a supplementary payment. So we're so, not taking so the money no, out of one, your pockets. One off. No, no, no. no one no, off payment. Joel, with due respect, you heard it. It's in Hansard. The Prime Minister made it clear that no one, 
no one will come off these payments. Well, the Prime Minister, to be clear, uh, hasn't said that you, you're never coming off the payment. We've gone through the Hansard on that. The Minister's office have told me this afternoon, our draft policy is not a set-and-forget situation. We'll continue to adjust our policies as required. And in the current legislation, there is a clear rule in place for the Minister to deliver further lump sum payments if there's a need. Um, where do you think that leaves it? Well, I, I've also checked the Hansard, not that I needed to, uh, David. Uh, uh, David Littleproud misled the Australian people last night when he told them, and more particularly our farmers, that they'll just keep getting this cash payment in the future. It's just not true. Uh, uh, you'll see I issued a statement today which included quotes from the actual portfolio minister, Bridget McKenzie, who has made it clear that this is a one-off payment on the way out. In other words, this is the government's exit payment that Barnaby Joyce and the National Farmers Federation were talking about this week. Prior to last night, no one anywhere in the government ever suggested to anyone that there'd be a, a second and even third payment. And of course, David, um, this is about one thing, and that is kicking any commitments they might make in the future beyond the budget year because they are so obsessed with this trophy budget surplus they've been pursuing. But think about this. What would be the rationale of cutting people off a, a fortnightly payment and then to give them one $13,000 cash payment or seven and a half if it's a single and then somewhere down beyond June next year giving them another cash payment? There is no logical rationale in that. David Littleproud was making it up on the run last night and sadly that's what Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull have been doing now for six years on drought policy. Would you welcome a second lump sum payment for them or you think the fortnightly payment should just continue while ever they're in a drought declared area? We should never have had an exit payment, David. They've now cut 600 desperate farming families off farm household allowance and another 1,100 by Christmas and they're just giving them this cash payment on the way out, again, I believe, to encourage them uh, to leave the land. And I keep saying, David, being able to survive into the eighth year of drought is not a reasonable test of viability. Many of these people could stay on the land but just haven't been able to make it through the, that sixth and seventh year of the worst drought in our history. Joel Fitzgibbon, live from Perth. Appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you.